Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Crypto Asset Analytics Workshop at the ACM Web Conference 2024. My name is Istvan, and today I'm going to talk about joint work with Alex Kovac entitled Anonymity Analysis of the Umber Stafford Scheme on Ethereum and both of ours from Utrecht Lorenz University. Um, this audience most of like most of most probably already knows that Ethereum is completely visible to all, and there are a bunch of for-profit companies that are selling on-chain intelligence, even to govern uh, governments, but to other uh, companies. Um, it suffice to mention chain analysis and elliptic, uh, and there are also a vast uh, body of academic work that deals with uh, coming up with heuristics and other methods how to de-anonymize uh, de addresses also on chain and also on the peer-to-peer -peer level. There's much more papers that I could cite, but maybe these are the most um, famous and most important ones on the blockchain level and also on the peer-to-peer -peer level. Um, but on the other hand, on the other side of the coin, there's also a lot of effort both in academia and in the industry to try to enhance anonymity since Ethereum is Turing complete. So uh, we can program arbitrary logic into the smart contracts that allows us to somehow enhance financial privacy. Um, the, maybe the most famous example was Tornado Cash, um, but Aztec is also a, a really important project. And in this work, we are focusing on Umbro Cash. I will talk about it later. Uh, yeah, but there's also Railgun, which is getting more and more popular. Um, yeah, so sadly, these are dark days for on-chain privacy. Uh, for instance, Tornado Cash was sanc sanctioned by the SEC in 2022, August, and afterwards, the devs were charged and arrested. Re very recently, uh, a month ago, uh, Samurai devs were charged uh, by the de uh, Department of Justice uh, Samurai is a Bitcoin a privacy enhancing wallet. Similarly, Wasabi decided to shut down their services. They're going to shut down in, in two, three weeks. And so by the uh, beginning of June, uh, Wasabi is already a privacy focused Bitcoin wallet, uh, enabling people to coin join. Um, yeah. And, but luckily, we still have a few islands of privacy. Where, we, where users can enhance their privacy, Aztec, Railgun, and most importantly for us in this talk, Umbra Cash, which is spearheaded by two developers, Bendy Francesco and Matthew Solomon. It's community funded, um, mostly it's funded by Gitcoin grants. And also there's an EIP standardization where um, the stealth address protocol um, suggested by Umbra and this, this whole format, the stuff address format and the announcement format is standardized. So it's 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 um, it's getting um, it's pretty popular and getting standardized, which is good for adoption. Okay, so what is Umbra and the stuff addresses in more general? What are they? Um, so in Ethereum, if if an address is known to belong to Alice and the recipient address is known to belong to Bob. Uh, since we are in an account-based model where typically users own just a handful of addresses, one or two typically, then it's easy to see if Alice sends some money to Bob. Uh, it's, it's, it's trivial to see the amounts and, and the direction of the transaction when it happened. Uh, and maybe even sometimes already just by looking at the blockchain, it's easy to figure out the purpose of the transaction. Um, on the other hand, you, applying Umbra and stealth addresses, uh, Alice, the sender of the transaction, can conceal the fact that it sends some money to Bob. Um, so on the blockchain, what we have is just a single stealth address, which is just a fresh, random-looking address. Um, but it's not just a random address to Bob, and only Bob knows that that address and transaction belongs to him. Uh, for all the rest of the world, it just seems like um, a perfectly random transaction and address. And after Bob found that this specific stealth address belongs to him, Bob can do whatever it wants, I either transfer the money to some exchange or to some other address. 
Uh, so at the very high level, this is enough if you understand about Umbra and self-address uh, protocols, but I'm going to go a little bit deeper. Uh, okay, so uh, what we have in Umbra, this is um, how Umbra works. So we have a registry smart contract where recipients can register their public keys, senders read these public keys on the recipient public key and can send using um, the recipient's public keys and the Umbra smart contract, they can send and create non-interactively a, a fresh address, we typically call it staff address, and transfer money to this staff address. As you can imagine on the blockchain, there are many uh, staff addresses um, and Bob would like to figure out, the recipient would like to figure out which staff addresses belong to them. So the Bob will just scan the blockchain and uh, check a certain computation. And if it checks out, then they can redeem the money sitting, residing at, the, at those staff addresses. Um, Umbra was launched more or less three years ago and it, it it's pretty popular now. Uh, the, by the time we had a look at it, um, it had more like around tens of thousands of users, um, both on mainnet and also on the more, most important layer tools, such as Arbitrum, Optimism, and Polygon. And we can see that when um, Tornado Cash was sanctioned in 2022 August, um, privacy cautious users even flogged into these other privacy preserving schemes. So maybe we could claim that uh, after the sanctioning of Tornado Cash, all these uh, Umbra all, on all these layer twos have seen an even um, uh, an accelerating rate of adoption. Uh, so what are our contributions? We in this paper we analyze the anonymity guarantees of Umbra in practice. We define simple heuristics that decrease those anonymity guarantees. We evaluate them on mainnet and the, the before mentioned three rollups. And we also um, suggest some simple countermeasures. Okay, so let, let's go into the details. Uh, so uh, the recipient has, in the, this is um, how Umbra works. It applies a dual key stuff, a just generation algorithm. And if you understand basically the Fihaman key exchange, then basically this protocol is kind of just a twist on the classical the Fihaman key exchange protocol. So uh, the recipient publishes their view key and spending key and spending public key and spending view key. Uh, and uh, on chain, so the input for the sender is the public key of the sender and the public keys of the recipient. The sender can generate an ephemeral key R, R times D, G. Let's just use additive notation for now. And also the sender can compute a shared secret, which is just a hash of R times the view key of uh, the recipient and can send funds to CJ time uh, plus uh, the public key, the of the spending public key of the recipient, okay? And uh, on chain, what we will have is this ephemeral key and the public uh, key of the staff address. So now how can the recipient, so this was the algorithm of the sender, now in turn, how can the recipient um, check or detect on the blockchain whether a certain staff address belongs to them? So what they need to do is Again, they can recompute using, they have, they know the discrete logarithm of the uh, viewing public key, so they can recompute using the ephemeral um, key this term, and they just need to check whether the left-hand side that they can compute equals the right-hand side, which is um, just a self-address or self-public key on the blockchain. If, 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 it, if this equality holds, then the, the recipient is sure that um, that staff transaction uh, belongs to them. So they, they will be able to redeem that money. Uh, and note that this algorithm is, is, is a linear 
scanning algorithm because this algorithm needs needs to check every single stealth transaction on the blockchain. And as, it, as you can imagine, um, we would expect that Umbra, hopefully in the near future, will have hundreds of thousands of users. And then clearly this naive linear algorithm for detecting payments is not going to work. It's not scalable. And it's just a great example where there was a, and, and this, this phenomenon and this uh, problem is also similar what Monero or Zcash and Aztec and any privacy preserving cryptocurrency faces. Um, and it's interesting that this little problem, like how to improve on the linear time and space algorithm for detecting uh, stuff transactions spurred a whole um, research direction in cryptography. So it's it's just another example where cryptocurrency inspired a new research problem and direction for cryptography. Okay, so what are the anonymity guarantees? We could give formal uh, game-based uh, definitions, but let, let me just restate it in plain English. So stealth addresses provide recipient anonymity, namely that if the challenger sends either to Alice or Bob, then the adversary cannot distinguish to whom the challenger sent the payment, non-negligible better than simply guessing. So this is recipient anonymity. Recipient unlink unlinkability says that imagine that there are two universes. In the first universe, the there are two payments sent to Alice and Bob. And in the second universe, the payment has the, the same recipient, so either Alice or Bob. And uh, recipient unlinkability dictates that the adversary cannot distinguish efficiently between these two universes with non-negligibly uh, non better than guessing. Uh, OK, so now, now the question is, how much recipient anonymity and recipient unlinkability is provided by Umbra in practice. Um, so the, we define two heuristic, uh, four heuristics, and which essentially breaks these guarantees. So the first heuristic is simple. Uh, whenever the recipient uh, finds their staff address, they just withdraw the money to an address that, that they already registered in, in this registry smart contract. So basically, they link the recipient address directly to the staff address, which is basically the simplest heuristic one can come up with. Uh, perhaps the second heuristic is even more simpler. Um, most likely, these are just testing transactions. The users apply these patterns and behaviors, I suppose, for either for testing or to airdrop farming. So. Um, in this case, we saw some examples where users withdraw money from staff addresses back to their original uh, address, which doesn't make much sense, seemingly. Um, we also define um, heuristic three, which basically breaks recipient unlinkability because we also saw many examples of users who collected uh, and consolidated money from withdraw money from multiple staff addresses into a single address, recipient address. So in this case, we, we can heuristically conclude that these payments, these staff addresses are owned by the same person. So this clearly breaks recipient unlinkability. Heuristic four that we defined um, is that if there are multiple withdrawal transactions from staff address ABC with the very same um, unique gas price, then we conclude that these are also owned by the same person. So in fact, recipient ABC is the same. Uh, yeah. Okay, what are the results? So what we have seen is that already heuristic one and two, the simplest heuristics, already break kind of um, the majority of the transactions on, on mainnet, Arbitrum and Optimism. On Polygon, these two transactions only capture 25% of the transactions. Um, okay, yeah, so just a visual reminder that these are the heuristic one and two. The, the two simplest uh, heuristics already catch a lot of people on all of the uh, studied networks. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so uh, we can break recipient unlinkability as already mentioned. Um, just by looking at, at heuristics uh, three, if all the staff addresses were owned by different recipients, then what we would observe is that for every staff address have equal probability to be owned by any of the registered addresses, but this is not the case. So this would be the naively one might think that this is the entropy of uh, of the probability distribution that what's the ownership between staff addresses and registrant addresses. But after applying and uh, and clustering all the staff addresses that belong together, then this distribution clearly is not uniform anymore and the entropy reduces largely. So recipient unlinkability also in practice doesn't hold. Uh, in this graph, we can see that there are many addresses where um, like there are a handful of addresses to be more precise that uh, collect money and consolidate money coming from dozens or even hundreds from different staff addresses. Okay, uh, our open, our code is open sourced at um, this GitHub link. Uh, feel free to give a star to the repo. And if you want, you can just um, uh, use it or build up on this repository. Feel free to open uh, issues. Yeah, and this is the, the QR code should also uh, point to this uh, link. Uh, so yeah, what are the countermeasures? Uh, well, the easiest is that wallet software should prevent these leakages or at least warn users that, hey, don't do this because otherwise you reveal these links between staff addresses and registrant addresses. Uh, obviously, in address reuse should be discouraged, although this is um, pretty difficult in an account-based currency, just like Ethereum. Uh, unique dress prices should be avoided. Uh, maybe a standardized gas price algorithm would be nice for at least for privacy cautious users. Uh, yeah, and I got. I would assume that many more heuristic could be employed. These are we were only scratching the surface. Uh, we just only proposed these four heuristics in our paper, but uh, most likely there's much more than what we could do. For instance, we could apply wallet fingerprints. I think that's uh, generally an interesting research direction, which is kind of underexplored for Ethereum. Cross-chain leakages, I think that's also really interesting um, from a privacy point of view, because all the aforementioned layer twos, like Polygon, Arbitrum Optimism, and all the rest, are using the very same address format what Ethereum uses. So. If one is able to link um, one particular address on, let's say, Arbitrum, and then they could transfer this knowledge to the other remaining layer twos. If the user is present, then also on those uh, networks, then one can basically transitively uh, apply this leakage to other networks. So, and I think this cross-chain leakage is not really explored in the privacy literature. Maybe it's already employed by chain analysis and other industry uh, participants, but I, I, I haven't seen uh, in the context of Ethereum to, to, to use this idea. And I, I would be happy to see such a work. Um, and yeah, a privacy preserving wallet should be, would be really nice for Ethereum, which basically tries to protect user privacy from starting from on-chain privacy down to, um, down to network privacy, uh, yeah, that that that's that's a huge overtake, but but would be really useful. Uh, yeah, and and there's a future work. I don't know any academic work that analyzes the anonymity guarantees of Aztec and Railgun in practice. I think that's that would be also an interesting um, avenue for future work. Um, thanks for your attention, uh, and let let us know if you have any questions. Thank you.